Okay, good evening, dear colleagues, for this uh, webinar on uh, vesicovaginal fistula. Um, we will have uh, the honor and uh, opportunity to hear from colleagues from all around Europe um, about the, this topic. Uh, I will start just with a few words of introduction about the vesicovaginal fistula. Just to remind what is vesicovaginal vesico fistula, it's an uh, <clears throat> abnormal communication between bladder and vagina, and more generally, urogenital fistulae or abnormal communication between the urinary tract and genital tractors. You, you can see different type of, of uh, different example of vesicovaginal fistula. We have to keep in mind two main types, the obstetric fistula caused by obstructed second part of lab labor, and the main pathophysiology mechanism is tissue necrosis. It includes also uh, in 8 to 14 percent of cases rectovaginal fistulae. Uh, on the opposite, the atrogenic fistulae uh, are caused by a care procedure, uh, mainly hysterectomy or C-section or other of like a prolapse or incontinence or diverticular surgeries. Um, <clears throat> the main pathophysiology mechanism is tissue tearing. And we here have to specify that uh, when patient had radiotherapy, there are there are specific tissue lesion like hypoxia and obliterance and arteritis that may impair healing of tissue. Well, vesicovaginal fistula have two phases, two main phases. One phase is in the low-income countries. Their vesicovaginal fistula are mainly obstetrical. They are endemic and frequent. And <clears throat> on, on other part of the world, in high-income countries, now vesicovaginal fistulae are iatrogenic, rare also constantly seen. If we look at the uh, obstetric fistulae, we clearly see that the spreading of obstetric fistulae in the world uh, follow uh, the uh, income per habitant um, with uh, the poorest place in the world with a higher uh, prevalence of obstetric uh, fistulae. It's difficult to have clear numbers because fistulae and uh, constant incontinence that come with uh, still represent a big taboo. Um, but the estimated prevalence is uh, around uh, <clears throat> the upon 18 uh, on 1,000 women um, uh, of the women at giving birth age, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. And the incidence is um, estimated between uh, 0.6 and 6.5, we see a wide range because of this taboo and this difficulty to get data and uh, <clears throat> for uh, 1,000 births. At the opposite, uh, as we can see in this recent uh, study, in an high-income country, it's only only it's almost only iatrogenic fistula that are seen. There is no real obstetric fistula, sometimes traumatic, obstetric traumatism, but not the real uh, long second part of labor uh, mechanism. What we can see here from France is that on the last uh, decade, uh, we had around 600 patients a year diagnosed with a fistula. Uh, and... Uh, one half in a row treated with a um, reconstruction intent. Um, another, almost another half or a third, uh, stay only with a drain and <clears throat> some a part viable with the ear go directly for uh, diversion. And what we can see also that the rate of uh, irradiated people is maximum in the people going directly for um, diversions. Um, 
that the main feeder, the main epidemiologic feeder of fistulae. The main complaint with fistulae is, of course, urinary incontinence, classically permanent and insensible, with no desire to void, and most often, when the hole is large, with no more micturition. Small fistulae can be a, a little more tricky to diagnose, um, like uh, in the Youssef syndrome with a very small fistulae between the bladder and the uterus that can only talk as a catamania and hematuria with repeated early spontaneous abortion. But this is, this is extremely rare. How to diagnose uh, um, vesicovaginal fistulae? Well, physical examination first with the blue dye tests and the gynecologic position, position with a powerful light. Almost no fistula can resist this test. Here we can see an example with a very small fistula on the bladder uh, neck. When the balloon is pulled, uh, we cannot see any leakage of blue. And as soon as we push the balloon away from the bladder neck, we release the blue and we can see the blue is very small fistulae after uh, a tape surgery. Uh, when uh, one finds a hole in the vaginal part, it has to be it has to be find the other part. Sorry, the other part uh, on the on the bladder, and here a uh, carrier has been pushed into the hole, and it also can serve to expose during the surgery, and we can. We can see that the, the fistula is away from the trigon and away from the uh, ureter orifice. In some cases, in some cases, for oops, in some cases, it could be useful to go for imaging, mainly for MRI for small vesicovaginal fistula. And I will end up with this uh, slide on the general principle of uh, vesicovaginal uh, fistula treatment uh, with uh, <clears throat> surgical uh, sequence, so surgical timing, first resection incision, then splitting bladder from vagina, then watertight bladder suture, and after only vaginal closure, and at the end, uh, drain urine long enough. At the same time, before and after the surgery, always fight against the healing enemies, anemia and tissue hypoxia, infection and denutrition. Of course, we, we have some general uh, recommendation about the strategy, but this evening we will see with uh, experts uh, the actual techniques and results of the different way to cure vesicovaginal fistula and different type of the vesicovaginal fistula. So I will give the the I will give the place to Dr. Tamsin Greenwell from uh, University College of London, and Tamsin will talk uh, to us about uh, the vaginal approach uh, to treat vaginal vesicovaginal fistula. Tamsin? Yeah, thanks. I'm just sharing. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to talk to everybody about vaginal repair of the psychovaginal fistula. The first successful vaginal repair of a psychovaginal fistula, indeed the first successful repair ever of a psychovaginal fistula, was in 1838 and it was reported by the American gynecologist J. Marion Sims. The principles of treatment then remain the same today as they were, and it's excision of the fistula margin with or without the tract, tension-free closure and interposition of healthy tissue. The root of repair should really be vaginal unless, and these are the uh, mores of today, uh, that's an early repair following a total abdominal hysterectomy. It's a high fistula in a fixed narrow vagina or a high fistula in a deep capacious vagina in an obese patient 
or if there's ureteric involvement or another indication for an abdominal repair. The reason that urologists don't seem to have adopted vaginal repair as enthusiastically as abdominal or robotic or laparoscopic is there's a perception that's more difficult and that it takes longer. But actually, the more you do, the more you realize that actually the only indications for vaginal repair uh, for, for an abdominal repair and not to do a vaginal repair are early repair following a total abdominal hysterectomy because you've already got the abdominal scar there and why would you make a new one? And ureteric involvement or other indication for abdominal approach. All of the others are, are easily repairable vaginally with experience. And when I started at UCLH in 2002, we repaired about 50% of our fistulae vaginally and 50% abdominally. And now we repair 95% vaginally. And in that time, the number of fistula that we've been referred annually has trebled. And you can see that the year on year um, successful closure rates have gone up both for abdominal and for vaginal repairs. This is a typical vaginal repair. This poor lady's got three holes, which have all got uh, open-ended ureteric stents in. I've got a self-retaining retractor with elasticated stays in, and I've used some uh, navy blue proline 3 to pull the fistula towards me. I've got a weighted sim speculum to give me a view, and I start circumscribing the fistula from below so that the blood runs away from me. All sutures that I place in the vagina are colour coded to be undyed monocryl or vicryl, and they're all held with a mosquito clip. My stays are held with the kerns. There's a difference in size. All sutures that I place on the bladder side of the fistula, um, and you can see it here with a rim of vagina attached to it, are with a 3-0 purple vicryl, and they're held with a mini mosquito. So I can easily distinguish which sutures in which tissue, which aids greatly in closure, especially if the fistula is deep uh, and the space is narrow. Here I'm mobilizing or circumscribing on the right side of the fistula, and then I'm going to uh, mobilize and circumscribe on the left. And each time I separate the overlying vagina from the underlying bladder, and I mobilize it widely so that there is no pull when I pick up the vaginal tissue uh, and there's no tension when we do the final closure. And here with the wonders of video editing is the fastest fistula repair in the world and we've made fully circumscribed and now we're mobilizing again the overlying vagina off the underlying bladder and then we're putting a stay in on the bladder side and then we're going to do some further mobilization so that we've got no tension at all when we close it. And we're going to suture our vagina away so that it's not interfering with the closure of the bladder side. And in this case, I'm going to do a continuous 3 ovicle closure of the fistula. And I'm leaving that rim of vagina tissue attached. Sometimes I'll excise it. It all depends on how it looks and how good the blood supply is. And as I say, I'm going to do a continuous closure in this patient. If it's deep and the access is difficult, I'll do interrupted sutures. And sometimes I'll use my stays uh, to close the fistula. It all really depends on vision and access. Uh, once we've got good closure, we take the uh, pollux out, close completely, and then we do a leak test with about 200 mils of saline. I rarely do a two layer closure because I always tend to use, uh, but, but not 100%, but mostly a modified Marsha's flat, flat pad flap into position. And you can see it being uh, taken here. So mobilizing, so midline incision, we take it on the posterior pedicle, mobilizing right and left sides, and then coming underneath, transecting on the superior pedicle and transligating then mobilizing down the lateral wall of the vagina, passing a Satinsky up because it's a perfect shape for this uh, procedure and passing the Marsha's labial fat pad through into the vaginal aspect of the wound. Then suturing the fat pad into position because I don't want it to pull back and the sutures are put into the perivaginal fascia. I use six separate sutures to do this over 
the uh, bladder repair. So it's got some nice healthy tissue. Um, and if they develop stress incontinence, there's a nice healthy tissue plane uh, to operate and put a sling in. Uh, and then closing the vagina, I do it horizontally or vertically. It depends on how it wants to lie. Um, and I uh, avoid narrowing the vagina. Then the labia is closed over a suction drain. I've used a hemostat there, but I don't always. I close the fascia with a 3 vicral and the skin with a subcuticular uh, vicral. And then it's a thing of beauty again. So the main points are to delineate the fistula, having brought it into view, and then to circumscribe it, then to develop the plane between the vagina and the bladder, then to close the bladder aspect, then to take a modified Marsh's fat pad flap and transpose it into the vagina over the bladder closure, to suture it over, and then to close uh, the wounds again. And you can see uh, this um, uh, picture three months after uh, a vaginal repair, the modified Marsh's fat pad flap, that actually the cosmetic appearance is excellent. An alternative, in an, generally in an older, but not always, a woman who isn't sexually active and doesn't feel that they will want to become sexually active is to repair with a corpoclasis. This is a lady who has a pessary related uh, fistula and you can see her prolapse after removal of the pessary. You can see the pollock catheter in the fistula. And here we've started to mobilize the flaps of the vagina off the underlying bladder. We've then closed the bladder, taken a fat pad, which we then transpose. Uh, I find that this helps actually with uh, avoiding recurrence of the prolapse. I don't do that many uh, repairs with colpocleasis, uh, but we do do quite a number of repairs after uh, pessary related fistula, and we haven't had a recurrent prolapse so far, so it may well help with that. You can see that the vaginas mobilize widely. We're going to excise most of the epithelium of the anterior and posterior walls, just leaving narrow lateral channels to drain, and this is the appearance post-operatively. Uh, you'll be glad to know we all also removed this lump for her and she was delighted. The instruments that you need are a self-retaining retractor. This is a figure of eight or for our French colleagues, a barber popper shaped um, retractor with some sharp small hooks. Uh, I use a weighted sim speculum and a silicone catheter. With this catheter, there's a cath with this uh, retractor, there's a catheter holder. Um, my, I have color coded and clip size coded uh, sutures. Uh, I use proline, uh, which is blue 3 for stays with a Cairns clip. I use uh, undyed vicryl or monochrome for the vaginal wall with a mosquito clip and 3 purple vicryl with a mini mosquito for the bladder side. I use a, a Satinsky to pass the fat pad through, a catheter fixator because uh, you don't want your catheter pulled out, some dermabond or liquid glue to help aid the closure of the labial skin and suction drain. This is our mini ready vac. If you can't repair the fist of the vagina, and remember that's less than 5% of the cases, uh, then you can, then you should close it abdominally. And whether you do that open or laparoscopically and robotically or robotically depends on your expertise. But I have to say that I don't really buy the laparoscopic or robotic surgery is that much, is much more cosmetic than standard open abdominal surgery. Um, you can see that this is, I've slightly rigged it, I know with the abdomens, but there's a nice fan and steel here that you could keep hidden under your pants or knickers. Uh, whereas if you had a robotic or laparoscopic repair, you'd have to borrow a very large pair of pants from Gilles' mother. Robots are expensive, almost two million pounds to buy and a hundred thousand a year to maintain. You, uh, they cost hundreds of pounds or thousands um, in uh, consumables for each case. And robotic surgeons are quite expensive with fast cars uh, and equipment. Whereas open surgeons just need a scalpel and some gloves are generally quite cheap and will often work for 50p in a packet of crisps. But on the serious side, you should only do an abdominal repair if you need to simultaneously do a ureteric reimplant, clam cystoplasty, or repair a bowel fistula. If you need to do an abdominal repair, if you're an expert, you can do it laparoscopically or robotically. And here you can see a picture of the robot at UCLH holding my back.
Having said the indications for an abdominal repair, I have actually re-implanted three ureters through the vagina, through relatively large psychovaginal fistulas, and none of them have to date had any further problems in terms of the ureter. And this is the kind of case that gets an open abdominal repair at University College Hospital. This is a lady who had a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, and she's ended up with a colovaginal, a colovacycal, a psychovaginal fistula, an entrocutaneous fistula with an incisional hernia, and a completely occluded right ureter. And so she had an open repair with an anterior resection for her bowel fistula, closure of the colovacycle fistula, repair of the psychovaginal fistula, ileal shoot for the ureter, repair of the entrocutaneous fistula, and a stratage repair of the hernia. And I don't think even Benoit could do that robotically. If you look at the outcomes of vaginal repair, success rates are excellent, over 75% in most series. And if you use a tissue interposition like a Marsh's fat pad flap, then over 90%. And it may be that a Marsh's fat pad flap reduces dyspareunia and stress incontinence. Like everything in life, your first chance is often your best chance of a successful repair, but you can get closure on the first, second, third, and occasionally the fourth, but never after the fourth repair, looking at the series to date. The main complications of all forms of um, fistula repair, and including vaginal, is stress incontinence, up to 55% in some series. That's mainly for the post-obstetric fistula repairs. Uh, you can also get vaginal stenosis and consequent dyspareunia, and rarely ureteric injury. The controversies are, should you use something like a Marsh's fat pad every time? Uh, there was a randomized series that suggested it doesn't affect the outcome in obstetric fistula, uh, but there was a suggestion that it does improve outcomes in surgical fistula. There's a perception it adds to the length of the operation and to the complications. We looked at 159 women who'd had a modified Marsh's fat pad had as part of their vaginal procedure at UCLH and we looked at short and long-term complications and patient perception of uh, cosmesis. 79% of them thought that it was good or excellent, only one, that's 0.6%, thought the appearance was unsatisfactory. We had two labial hematomas and one wound infection and again you can see the post-operative appearance is excellent. Another controversy is should you repair these uh, should you repair fistula early or delayed? Well, early should really be for three weeks when the tissues become sticky and like blotting paper and don't hold tissues, don't hold sutures. And delayed is about four to six months after the injury. Most sources would agree that all obstetric fistula should have delayed repair at four to six months, although in carefully selected patients, there have been some successes earlier. I rarely get sent um, early fistulae, um, but I've repaired six to date in my experience with five of them successful, and then one was successful at a delayed repair. And of 129 closures that I looked at about five years ago that I'd done personally, my own first time closure rate for delayed repair was 93.8% with a 99% success rate overall. There is a learning curve like everything, for vaginal repair of a psychovaginal fistula. And these are my first 100 cases. And you can see there's an improvement in primary closure type rate at each quartile. Another controversy is how should you manage recurrent fistula? And Osman is going to talk about that in detail. But really the route should be dictated uh, by access and any additional um, procedures. But all things being equal, vaginal should be the route of choice if you look at comparative series, success rates vary from 33 to 100%, uh, the older series having the uh, lower success rates. Your chances of primary closure are higher for small fistula that are iatrogenic, that have never had a previous attempt at repair, that have got no radiotherapy, and that have tissue interposition. So to conclude, the psychovaginal fistula in high resource settings is rare. Uh, Excellent outcomes can be had in the hands of expert fistula surgeons and their team. 
Uh, the psychovaginal fistula and urethrovaginal fistula services are probably concentrated at expert centres uh, because if you look at the rates of failure and the rates of primary diversion, they're twice as high in uh, non-expert centres as expert centres. Tissue interposition should be considered in all women who are having iatrogenic fistula repairs. And remember, vaginal repair is king. It's minimally invasive. Uh, microsurgery, single port, natural orifice, and it's inexpensive and effective. And with that, I'll leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamzin. And now um, we're going to give, uh, we're going to hear uh, Dr. Erando from uh, Pritvier Foundation uh, in Barcelona on the the uh, abdominal approach to repair uh, vesicovaginal uh, fistula, which kind of approach for which fistula? Okay, you have to apologize me a little bit because the light in my hall disappeared. So you will see me a bit dark in this moment, but I'm going to share the screen as soon as possible. I hope the light will come back early because they are doing some work in my hospital. Well, um, these are my conflicts of interest. I, unfortunately, I cannot uh, show you any uh, video like Tansin did because we are presently doing uh, one abdominal repair per every eight or 10 vaginal repairs. So you see that we are more or less, um, uh, we more or less agree that the, the idea that vaginal is, uh, it's the king or could be the queen in this moment. But uh, we do, as, as I told you, one uh, abdominal parade or 10 vaginal. So unfortunately I have not videos because this year we just made one uh, abdominal <coughs> repair. So the indications for abdominal repairs would be uh, fistulas that are too high in the bladder to be reached transvaginally. We must take into account that gynecologic complications uh, that are iatrogenic, not uh, obstetric, but uh, for example, after hysterectomy can be very high. And then in some cases, the vagina uh, can be very difficult to, to, to allow you the access in, in, this is especially in cases when there is no cystocele at all. If there is a minimal degree of cystocele, then you can perform a vaginal repair because you know, with the patient under anesthesia and pulling a little bit from the vagina, uh, the, the fistula hole comes to you. But there are some young patients that have uh, very uh, tight vaginas and when the hole is very, very high, very up in the bladder, in which that is very difficult to access vaginally. Then another case would be vaginal scarring due to previous procedures, vaginal scarring due to radiotherapy or brachytherapy that produce those uh, frozen pelvics with very, with very narrow vaginas. Just one finger can enter into these vaginas and then makes the vaginal repair very uncomfortable. And also we must take into account the hospital setting and the anesthetics that precludes, for example, other indication that could be laparoscopy or robotics. Uh, other indication for abdominal repair is when uh, concurrent transabdominal procedures like reimplantation and augmentation or using of a mental grafts uh, is, uh, is uh, advisable. Uh, another possibility is when fail less invasive attempt was this. I put this uh, in brackets because normally I attempt again vaginally, but this could be a consideration if you fail once vaginal and you are not uh, comfortable with the vaginal route for a second uh, procedure would be uh, a possibility to do it uh, abdominal. And also you must take into account as always patient's preference and, and surgeon's preference, as Tamsin said, uh, the route of the repair depends on your uh, uh, your ability and your, uh, your skills on doing this exact technique. So this must be taken into account as well. Well, this is the, the Preoperative setting normally is done under general anesthesia because you have to do a, a infra umbilical lapar la laparotomy or 
a fan steel incision and it's more comfortable under general. The position is more or less like this under supine with the hips abused uh, and light flexion and with mild Trundelenburg. Actually, I prefer to put the steel ropes lower than that figure because I realized that when you put the, the legs uh, quite low, this produces some tension in the lower abdomen that uh, makes easier the, the access to the pelvis. Um, it's important to have a vaginal simon or L-shaped vaginal valves to, um, to mobilize the vagina and to have ureteral catheters and a Foley catheter in place available for, for the surgery. Well, one possibility of doing uh, abdominal approach is the O'Connor. This was described as, uh, as soon as 1951. Uh, this is the earlier paper I, I found and consists on doing a midline in from umbilical incision, opening the peritoneum, as you can see in the figures one and two, and then doing a longitudinal opening of the bladder, as you can see in the figure three, from the bone through, uh, through the, in the direction of the Douglas space, and then up to find the fistula orifice. So in this dissection, the, the bladder is uh, separated from the vagina. Then at this moment, you do a circular opening around the fistula hole developing a, a plane. This plane, it's important to have at least one or two centimeters uh, around the fistula tract to have wide margins in order to get a, a, a tension-free closure. Uh, one idea is to close uh, the vagina uh, in one layer transversely, if it's possible put a tissue graft if it's necessary, and then uh, doing a longitudinal bladder closure into layers. Uh, in, in this case, it's important. It's, it's the only way to close the bladder in longitudinal way because you open it in this way uh, longitudinally so that you must close it in the same uh, way. Another possibility, and is the one that I use when the fistula is not very, it's not very big and it's, it's quite high, I tend to use this one and its transvesical root. This uh, was described uh, by Gil Bernet in 1989. I find quite quite uh, interesting root because you don't have to open the peritoneum. Well, the idea is to do a midline and from umbilical incision or fanestil. Then you see here in the B figure that the hole for this uh, in this paper of 1989 is a big hole in the trigon. I must say that if you have a big hole in this place, normally you can you can uh, make it vaginally, but you can imagine that this uh, surgery can be done with with quite uh, upper um, orifices, um, much much uh, much higher than this one. Then the idea is to dissect pulling from a small foley or a fogarty catheter and do a dissection around the hole. Then we'll normally put uh, uh, catheters in the ureters and then you do a closure of the vagina initially and then you either can close the hole. I, I, I must tell you again that this is the, the surgery that I select for small holes so I don't do this, this kind of flap that you can hear here but it's an interesting tool that you can use in, in big holes. And this is interesting because when you do this you can you can do a, a transversal closure of the vagina and, uh, sorry, longitudinal closure of the vagina and transversal closure of the bladder. Therefore, you are having this, uh, this difference in the holes. So it's very interesting to avoid uh, recurrence. Another interesting possibility is the extra vesical root. This was described uh, for the first time in 1893. Unfortunately, it was impossible for me to get the original paper, even though I found a lot, but I think I, I will find it in the future. The interesting point of this extra vesical root is that it avoids a cystotomy, and the idea is to dissect the fistulous uh, tract through the peritoneal uh, vesicovaginal plane. Some years later, this is an article from 2021, they described exactly that von Dietl described in 1893. They called novel extravesical uh, trans trans uh, vesical technique. And the idea is to dissect from, uh, from behind 
dissecting the bladder, but not opening the, the bladder and then closing the vagina, closing the bladder and do an interposition if it's necessary. And this is the uh, technique that is mainly used in laparoscopy. So the idea of this extra vesical route is that this can be done also uh, in a transabdominal uh, way. Well, uh, that is something interesting regarding the excision of the fistulous tract. The excision of the tract that is also called trimming was classically described as an essential step of the surgery uh, in order to resect the tissue and provide the healthy margins. However, a white margin can, re can result in a larger defect at, at the end. So this increased the tension on the repair and recurrence. And actually there are some data that you can find in the text that I, that I put here, the references here, that uh, compare uh, excision and not excision, so trimming or not trimming of the of the fistula tract, and the results are comparable in in both techniques. So I would say that excision should be depending on a case by case basis, depending on the on the atrophy or the uh, vascularization of the of the tract. Tissue interposition well, is it's something that I always consider because once you have opened the the abdomen of this patient. Uh, I think it's very easy to, to use a mental flaps and I tend to, to, to use it in every case that I do uh, with the O'Connor technique. This was described as early as 1937. You can use the, the different kind of flaps, epiploic appendices uh, of, of the colon, pelitoneal flaps, but I'll, I always tend to use a mental flaps because it's very easy to, to regard the mental and, and put it down there. There are also some uh, some articles. I have no experience in using platelet rich plasma or fibrin glue, but these uh, articles that I put you here for your for your uh, review, if you are interested, um, are quite interesting and interesting possibilities, although more expensive. Well, these are the principles of an effective repair, and I use this slide also as a take home messages. It's important to do a good exposure of the fistulous tract. This is something that you will have for sure in an abdominal repair. Trimming or not, uh, it's under brackets because, uh, well, you, you will decide in a case by case basis, depending on the aspect of the vascularization of the hole, as I already said. To do a double uh, layer bladder tension flick closure is very important. I see it's uh, the typical way of uh, closing the bladder. Interposition of tissue if it's necessary, but I also told you that normally when I open the, the abdomen, I'll always use the mental flap because it's very easy to, to use it. And once you have opened the bladder, uh, sorry, the abdomen, I think it's worthwhile to use it. It's important to do a, a filling of the bladder to, to be absolutely sure that it's a watertight uh, closure to use a continuous post-operative bladder drain and also the a nightmare for every urologist is the effective management of spasms in the post-operative period. In my practice, I tend to use a, a quite small Foley to use a 12 or 14 uh, Foley catheter in place. And my idea is uh, to allow, if there were spasm, to allow the urine to go around the Foley and not going through it fistulose tract. So, well, this is my idea. I have no randomized control studies on that, but in my case, it's working pretty well. And uh, this is all my presentations. I am open to questions at the end. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, very nice presentation. We can switch now to Benoit uh, for the robotic approach. Um, so, Benoit, the scene is yours. Okay. So, okay. I do share my screen. I hope you can see it. So thank you very much for inviting me to talk about the robotic approach. Very hard to, to talk about the robotic approach after Tamsin and Carlos have done such a nice job 
proving that we don't need robotic to do that, but I try to prove you that it may be helpful. So obviously when we think of urogyne ecology in general, we think of vaginal approach as I think Tamsin nicely showed to us. Um, and basically urogyne ecologists uh, um, feel that everything can be done transvaginally. But I think we may all agree that um, for some procedures, the abdominal approach can be of help. Of course, we know about Birch colpose suspension, sacrocolpopexy, of course, and also I'll try to prove that to you, some of the vesicovaginal fistula. Uh, when we talk uh, of uh, the abdominal approach, and especially for pelvic surgery in general, uh, one of the assets of laparoscopic surgery first, before to talk about the robot, is that it really helps to have a better vision deep in the pelvis below the pubic bone, where usually the problem is when you have vesicovaginal fistula. So pneumoperitoneum may decrease blood loss uh, during dissection in the pelvic area. And of course, you have all the assets of the minimally invasive approach with enhanced recovery, less pain, blah, 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 compared to an, an open incision. Uh, but then when robots comes into play, as you know, robotic has revolutionized, I would say, abdominal surgery in many areas. And I think we should not surrender just because we are uh, functional urologists. We should not consider that uh, we do not have rights to uh, happiness and to comfort and to, and to great surgery, I would say. So we, functional urologists, can also embrace robotic surgery. And of course, it has many assets that you probably already know, the under risk that helps you to have a lot of freedom with your instruments in the abdomen, the tremor filter, which is very great for a coffee drinker, drinker like me, the 3D vision, of course. And as always, when I talk about um, uh, the asset of robotic surgery, I think probably the, the main asset is the educational power of robotic surgery in terms of vision, simulators, etc. cetera. Uh, and the truth is, vesicovaginal uh, fistula repair can be pretty challenging as we have already seen during that webinar. One of the things that can make a vesicovaginal fistula repair challenging is that the fistula is often quite close from the ureteral orifices. The fistula can be large and you can have poor quality tissue. To be fairly honest with you, um, we are in an area where we do not have very high quality of evidence. We have very, very little prospective data. And to be fairly honest, nobody really knows what is the best approach for vesicovaginal fistula repair. Is it vaginal versus abdominal? Is it extravesical versus transvesical? Do we need to do tissue interposition or no tissue interposition? And the list could go and on like this, on and on like this, because there are many unanswered questions when it comes to the technique of vesicovaginal fistula repair. So if I had to convince you that robotic is great for vesicovaginal fistula repair, I would say definitely for supratrigonal fistula, uh, it's really great because uh, those fistula are often very deep uh, and difficult to access transvaginally. And, um, and also, of course, the great thing is um, that you can see nicely the ureteral orifice uh, and ureters, I, as I will show you. And I have to admit that with growing experience, um, I would say the threshold tends to lower, in, uh, I would say, in terms of anatomical landmarks to go for robotic versus transvaginal. And I would say now, uh, as I often uh, tell to my residents, everything bladder neck and up, I would do it robotically, at least right now in my experience. So then uh, there is various techniques of robotic repair. I will go very quickly on most of them, but this one, and it's not from me, is a single pore uh, transvesical repair from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so you can actually stay extraperitoneal and do a pure transvesical repair. The issue is that uh, I, I think Gilles nicely emphasized the principles of vesicovaginal fistula repair. And the issue here to me is to 
divide really the two plans. So we see that they try to divide the uh, vesical, the bladder wall and the vaginal wall uh, from the inside, but definitely from the outside, I think it's much easier to do that. Uh, but then again, it's doable, purely transvesical, extraperitoneal, robotic repair for those kind of fistula. And of course, when you do pure transvesical like this, tissue interposition is not an option. There's no way for that you would bring any fat from anywhere when you're uh, using such uh, technique. Uh, then there is the extravesical technique. And I have to tell you that it's not my favorite, uh, but I've tried it. This is mine. Uh, and, and I've tried to stay uh, purely extravesical. It's doable. Um, the issue is that this plan is really not nice to dissect as always because, uh, and, and at some point you will enter the fistula. And I mean, when you decide to go abdominally, really one of the, I would say, the, the, the main benefits is to be able to nicely see everything and especially especially the ureters. And my issue with the extra vesical approach is that it's really, really hard to know where the ureters are. Uh, so I know people put like a, a lightening uh, ureteral stand to know where they are, why not? But so in the end, even when I do a, an extra vesical repair, I ended up opening a bit more the bladder to see where I was. So I do excise um, the um, fistulous orifice on the vaginal side and on the uh, vesical side, I would say the bladder side. But again, um, I'm not very, very comfortable uh, with the extra vesical approach because Okay, we're gonna move to uh, and and give the the scene to Osman Koz from uh, Sakari University in Turkey. Uh, Doctor Koz will talk about uh, the flaps in complex fistula repair, and we will come back to Benoit uh, after uh, Doctor Koz's uh, presentation. Osman, the scene is yours. Uh, you turn on your microphone. We see you perfectly. You are probably sharing your... Okay, excellent. We see your presentation. Thank you uh, very much uh, for the invite. Uh, I'm very pleased to join uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, uh, thank you uh, very much for the uh, excellent presentations uh, for uh, previous uh, previous presentations. I I'm going to talk about uh, flaps in complex vesicovaginal fistula repair. Vesicovaginal uh, fistula is a, a complex uh, illness by all uh, itself. Uh, but uh, some situations is making the uh, fistula more complex. According to WHO guideline, uh, if the patient has uh, fistula bigger than four centimeters, or uh, if the fistula have uh, uh, multiple openings, and uh, if the patient has uh, radiation uh, therapy and uh, the uh, and failed previous. Uh, repair, rectovaginal mixed fistula, uh, closing mechanism if involved uh, to, uh, and if there is a scaring around the fistula, if the if patient has circumferential defect and extensive tissue lost and if the intravaginal uh, ureters opening, all these are uh, can make the uh, Fistula, fistula treatment uh, make uh, more complex, and uh, vesicovaginal vaginal fistula complexity may preclude a reliable uh, closure. Uh, generally, we have to respect uh, principles of urinary fistula repair, but one of them is a uh, uh, very important: well vascularized, healthy tissue repair. 
and also of course adequate exposure the, of the fistula tract, tensile tension free overlapping sure lines, watertight uh, closure of each layer and multiple layer. All of these are very important, but uh, one of them is uh, might be uh, as important as others. Uh, we uh, for this purpose we can uh, use uh, flaps and flap uh, flaps can be classified according to blood supply tissue type and location of donor site and blood uh, supply they can be uh, classified as random flap and axial flap random flaps uh, utilizes the subcutaneous uh, vascular plexus but has no dominant vascular supply and because of this we have to respect uh, skin uh, flaps lengthened with ratio uh, Three over one and axial flaps, uh, which are, we are using as a Martius flap, Gracilis flap, and Omental flap, uh, these are uh, based and along one dominant artery. According to the tissue uh, types, random flaps, epithelial tissues such as skin or peritoneum, and axial flaps, visceral tissues such as omentum or fibropathy tissue such as labial uh, myora or muscular tissues. And lo lo location of uh, donor site, local flaps based on a uh, random blood supply, and distant flaps uh, may be pedicled or free flap. Uh, in that position, uh, tissue flaps uh, can be used vag uh, vaginal uh, road and abdominal uh, road. Vaginal repair, we are using Martius fat pad flap, peritoneal flap, gracilis flap, pubococcygeus muscle flap, and uh, Singapore uh, fasciocutaneous flap. And abdominal repair, omentum, appendices, and uracus flap uh, can be produced, and peritoneum and rectus muscle flaps. Radiation induced vesicovaginal fistula, I would like to mention. And, uh, this uh, type of uh, fistula has unique uh, presentation and unique behavior. 1.24% uh, of patients who underwent radiation therapy suffer uh, severe urologic complications such as vesicovaginal fistula. And 13% of fistula in the developed world develops uh, following uh, radio secondary to radiotherapy. Uh, radiation has unique effect on endothelial cells and they uh, it can cause uh, damage and it can cause and and arteritis obliterans uh, the at vascular tissue uh, intimal uh, uh, hyperplasia it, it can cause and this uh, causes obliteration of the uh, uh, arteries and the, it causes ischemia and uh, suburetral fibrosis and uh, and vesicovaginal fistula and we can't suppose when it uh, it can uh, be uh, cause fistula. I, uh, after primary care, it can uh, it may uh, take 15 to 20 years. So we have to uh, evaluate the physical radiation induced fistula uh, uh, as a whole because it can uh, cause a lot of problems at not only at uh, physical base but also bladder compliance and vagina rectum. All of them can be involved. So starting from the from uh, uh, his taking history to decide what we can do, do for the patient, we call it bladder compliance. But if there, as there is a fistula, we can we may not uh, we, we can't do uh, perform uh, urodynamics. But uh, at cystoscopy, we can uh, suppose bladder capacity, so we can uh, perform reconstruction or diversion substitution usually. Yeah, may be necessary because of uh, uh, capacity is decreased. This uh, this is a patient with uh, cancer uh, or cervical cancer uh, radiotherapy. Uh, so the left kidney had uh, hydro hyd uh, dilatation uh, and uh, he he has uh, kidney loss and the other part has uh, uh, dilatation. According to the study from 2009, uh, it is uh, the radiation 
vaginal fistula and the patient the, the study consists of 216 patients and 97% uh, of the patients had vaginal approach and abdominal approach performed at 2.8% uh, of the patients Marcius flap was used 41% of the patients and Lasko colpoclesis was used at 35% uh, of the patients primary repair uh, success rate was 48%, uh, percent, uh, but uh, secondary and tertiary uh, operations uh, results, uh, uh, cumulative success rate was 84.4%. Uh, 80. And in 1993, uh, uh, transvaginal repair of vaginal fistula uh, using a peritoneal flap was defined by, uh, by, uh, by an iconic name uh, named, uh, by RAS, and 12, 12 patients were operated and uh, nine patients uh, uh, cured completely. Another study uh, from uh, 2005, uh, six patients was uh, were operated and uh, the author uh, defined the procedure as a gold standard. At the operation, uh, the, the uh, incision start with uh, inverted uh, J incision and peritoneal flap uh, inferiorly uh, developed to vaginal cuff and peritoneum uh, is carried over the uh, over the closed vaginal fistula uh, fistula fistula and. Gracilis uh, flap uh, can be used uh, if the, there had been previous repair attempts at the, and the Marshall scrap had already been used. If the uh, labial folds uh, were secured or odometers as a result of external beam radiotherapy, as uh, as we know, inferior uh, gracilis muscle uh, starts from inferior muscle pubic ramus and uh, it uh, it. Uh, inserts on medial shaft or on tibia blow, a media, a medial conduit. And the vascular supply is a medial circumflex uh, femoral, femoral artery. And uh, this operation uh, uh, can be performed at a lithotum position. Uh, it starts with a, a small incision at a medial uh, condyle at uh, uh, tibia, tibia, and uh, the uh, insertion uh, uh, insertion ligament is uh, can be cut. And after this, uh, uh, gracilis flap is uh, developed, and it can uh, it is taken to uh, vagina be, 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 uh, with the tunnel be, be beneath uh, labium and uh, and uh, uh, vaginal mucosa, and. The study from 2020, 18 patients had, uh, 20 patients had uh, been operated, and 90% of patients uh, healed successfully. Six were completely dry with no urinary tract leakage. Seven women had post-operative complications, mostly urinary tract infection. And Singapore professor Professor Kutanus Flap was uh, defined. For the extensive loss of vaginal uh, mucosa, uh, second gen generally secondary to uh, obstructed labor, and it uh, it is uh, originally defined at 201988, uh, uh, but it's po it become po it is popularized after to, uh, to 2015. Singapore flap is a pudental type flap and centered on labiocoral fold uh, with the ba its base at the perineal body. Vascular supply is Posterior labial artery, so uh, care uh, should be taken uh, not to injure posterior labial artery. And uh, the incision is based at uh, the scale tubercity, uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, length of the uh, flap uh, can be can be. Uh, 15 to 16 centimeters and width can be uh, six centimeters. After creation of the flap, it is taken to uh, vagina beneath the, the tunnel created under the uh, labium maius and vaginal mucosa. A single, a single flap uh, from uh, used at a, at a study 2020 and 32 patients uh, were operated and success rate was uh, 68, uh, 68 per 
uh, person. Uh, Dye tests uh, were negative uh, at these patients, and uh, nine women cough tests negative, and 14, 13 patients had uh, women experienced postoperative complications, which was uh, primarily a minor wound breakdown uh, from the donor side. Omental flap has been using uh, since 1935. Uh, it is uh, uh, commonly used, uh, commonly used uh, if the uh, uh, transperitoneal approach uh, is used. And uh, 2016, a study from 2016, 38 surgical procedures uh, performed, and uh, 32 uh, women had omental flap. No recurrence has uh, seen. A six peritoneal flap, uh, peritoneal flap uh, was performed, but four patients with uh, peritoneal flap recurred. And rectus abdominis flap can be used for retrovaginal uh, uh, fistula, first um, vaginal, transvaginally retrovaginal uh, fistula closed, and uh, after this, uh, transabdominally, uh, the rectus abdominis uh, muscle uh, the flap uh, created, and the uh, 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 inferior epigastric artery is the main artery, artery, and rectus abdominis myofascial flap can be used for uh, complex fistula uh, uh, for vesicovaginal uh, fistula. Uh, after closing uh, the fistula, the flap uh, can be taken to uh, between vagina and uh, bladder. And uracal uh, flap, it is an anterior, anterior peritoneal flap. Uh, it, it is uh, created uh, with the separation from anterior, vagina, anterior bladder wall, and 13 patients uh, had been operated, uh, at, uh, for, uh, and five patients had failed previous repair, and uh, only one recurrence was seen the, from the study 2013. Thank you very much. I have finished. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Much, uh, Osman. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, very extensive with uh, all uh, the uh, subtle uh, techniques. Um, we we will uh, go back to Benoit to know if we can see the end of his presentation. Benoit. <clears throat> yes. Really sorry about that. First time it happens to me, I don't know why exactly. Probably the video was a bit too heavy. Uh, but so I, uh, most of the time, uh, robotically, which is uh, the O'Connor technique, as um, as uh, I think Carlos nicely emphasized. I think it's really it's to me the best technique because you can do a combination of transvesical. And extra vesicle. I always try, um, as I hope to show you now, to divide um, the plan between. So, okay, so I open the fistula uh, and I, I put um, a manipulator in the vagina, as you can see. Um, and It's a post hysterectomy fistula. And yeah, so what I like is you can, like, from like extra vesically, try to divide the abdominal wall and vaginal wall. But thanks to your cystotomy, your opening in the bladder, you can also nicely see uh, again where the ureteral orifices uh, are, what are the limits and, and ages of the. Um, bladder fistulous orifice. Uh, so you can see that we are losing some uh, pneumoperitoneum through the vagina. You can place a swab in the vagina to avoid that. And again, fully, and this will be one of my take home messages, you don't want to compromise um, what you do technically just because you go robotic or laparoscopic or whatever. You want to work as nicely as you do uh, vaginally or with an open abdominal incision, 
um, you, uh, even when you're using the robot. So you're trying to find the right plan. And I think really it's paramount, regardless of the approach, it's really paramount to find the right plan between uh, the vaginal wall and the bladder wall um, to really divide those two, to excise the fistulous orifice. And then, as I've shown earlier, um, I would close first the vaginal orifice horizontally. So I use barbed suture to do that. So I used to do only one layer of suture. And honestly, as we published recently, we had really good outcomes. But to be on the safe side now, I tend to do um, two layers just because, I mean, it's a little bit more fun with the robot, right? And then, um, and, and maybe it's safer. And then, in that case, and this is something that I tend to do more and more. Um, uh, so you see, I had the bleeding of the epigastric vessels here. I did harvest the peritoneal V flap, so it's uh, pedicled uh, on the umbilical ligament. And it's really nice because it's always fatty and bulky, even in skinny patients. It's really close from uh, the target uh, area that you want to reach. And I mean, in those abdomen with adhesions, multiple previous abdominal surgery, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's a li little bit painful, let's say, to get the omental flap. And this peritoneal flap is really, really helpful. So I wanted to show that to you. Uh, for those of you who would not know this peritoneal flap. And what I try to do is to, uh, to I mean, to secure this flap uh, in between uh, the bladder and the vagina. I like to do an uh, anastomosis kind of thing, meaning that I would do multiple, like I use a running suture and I really try to do um, a, a, a kind of an anastomosis to really make a watertight interposition uh, all around um, the previous uh, vaginal suture. And when once I'm done with that, so when I am very close from the ureteral orifice, I can robotically place ureteral stents. Here's the um, orifice, so just to show that we can close the peritoneum, but we don't care too much. And then, yes, uh, once the or ureteral orifices are far from the uh, fistulous orifice like here, uh, I just don't put ureteral stand and I would close from the inside, from, uh, let's say, bottom to top, uh, with a first uh, running barb suture, a VLOC suture, and then another suture like this. I, I like to do a leak test in the end to make me feel good, and then we're done. So that's the technique that I most often use now uh, with the robotic approach. Uh, just to show you that we've compared the transvesical and extravesical robotic uh, techniques, and the outcomes are fairly the same, uh, except that there was one ureteric injury in the extravesical approach, so I don't think it's useful. Just to show you really quickly that you can harvest the rectus muscles that Osman told to us about robotically. This is a video from my good friend Lizao, two or three times, and, and I, I would not say it's my go-to flap. Probably gracilis is less morbid, but uh, this can be done robotically too. Uh, and just to wrap up, I would say that I do like to leave a, a bladder drainage for a, a long time. I, I leave my urethral catheter for at least two weeks because I don't want to play with fire and I want to compromise the outcome just for a matter of a couple of days of uh, um, of bladder uh, catheter. So these are my takes for robotic vesicovaginal fistula repair, fistulous orifice excision. I rather do the O'Connor technique, barb suture is great, single layer closures in opposite directions, uh, and you can use omental or peritoneal D-flap or even mesosigmoid or, or, or uh, rectus fascia. Um, patient selection for robotics obviously depends on surgeon preference. You understood that I like it very much. Uh, and caution, of course, with radiation cystitis. So the take-home message is 
I hope that I've showed you that robotic VVF Reaper is doable for supratrigonal and trigonal fistula. The success rates in the existing series are pretty good. The color technique is really, really great, I, I think, and I, I like it very much. But again, the most important message is do not compromise on the quality of your surgery because of your surgical approach. I thank you very much for your attention. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, Benoit, thank you very much for your very nice presentation, always with very nice movies. And uh, uh, so we we are now done with all the presentation. I just, uh, I've, I've heard each of you very carefully, and I've tried to, uh, in a couple of slides, uh, give you, uh, synthesize all your key messages. So I will... Uh, once again, uh, share my screen. Um, okay, can you can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, for the key message in the introduction, we just uh, give a few insight into the. The epidemiology of uh, of fistula with the difference between obstetric fistula and iatrogenic fistula. Also, iatrogenic are the most common or almost the only in the high income countries, and the obstetric fistula are more common in low income countries. There is a rising up of uh, iatrogenic fistula also in low and intermediate uh, income countries. The incontinence is, of course, the main complaint, and we can see uh, fistula as a peak, a kind of a, a peak type of uh, incontinence, uh, a kind of Everest of incontinence in some cases, and physical examination and blue dye tests are still the best way to diagnose uh, vesicovaginal fistula. Uh, Tamzin uh, gave a talk on the vaginal approach, uh, she emphasized the need for expertise, the need for volume to increase the quality of results. Um, for her, of course, vaginal reaper is king. And as much as we can reach the fistula via a, a non-fibrotic and closed vagina, uh, as much we can, we, we have to go to uh, with this way and we can use, uh, if we uh, follow uh, uh, Tamsin advice, as soon as uh, as much as possible, uh, Marcius flap to ensure uh, the good healing of our repair. Um, Carlos give us uh, his view on the abdominal approach. We understand that the abdominal uh, repair still can be useful in selected cases and. Uh, these cases are challenging cases. Those in which the uh, vagina is uh, difficult uh, because is narrow and fibrotic, and also the cases with an involvement of the ureters and the 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 need to maybe reimplant ureters. There is different uh, uh, type of of technique, and what we understand after. Tamzin and Carlos uh, lecture that both approach are complementary. Then, sorry, then we go for uh, the robotic approach. Uh, <clears throat> so we we hear with uh, with Benoit that uh, the advantages of uh, robotic and excellent three D vision. And this ability to um, do precise uh, movement and dissection in very small spaces could probably bring something more in the field of uh, fistula surgery. So um, Benoit shows us different approach with a 
uh, is uh, preference for a transabdominal uh, with a, a, a transabdominal approach uh, with a transection of, of bladder and a dissection of the vagina going down further than the initial hole and then a closure of both uh, uh, hollow organ separately and the ability to interpose either omentum or peritoneal flap. With flap, flap uh, was the topic of uh, Osman goes and we see with Osman a very extensive presentation of, of all, uh, of, of many uh, techniques of flaps. We, we can uh, understand that flaps are important to know and not only for the more complex cases. At this point, we join the, the, the point of uh, Tamzin, who says before that even for simple uh, vaginal closure, uh, there is a, a, an advantage uh, with the uh, Martius flap. Uh, we understand that the main uh, uh, flaps with a vaginal approach are the Martius flaps, the gracilis, the gracilis muscle flap, a Singapore flap or lotus flap, and with abdominal approach, omental flap and rectus abdominis flap are uh, the most useful. So we need an overview of all the, the, the point of our experts. Uh, so we are close to conclude. Um, <clears throat> we, we may say a word about the holistic approach of uh, the vesicovaginal fistula. Of course, it's very important to close the hole, but it's also important to think about uh, continence after closing the hole, um, <clears throat> sexual life, and maybe sexual dysfunction after closing the hole. Fertility also can be uh, impaired. So we can go further maybe in another webinar on this fascinating area and, and uh, uh, we all share our passion for uh, reconstructive surgery uh, uh, around this topic. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, I, I look at my, at my colleague. Would you, would you like to add something? No, thank you very much, everybody. And your questions and comments have been excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank so you very much. We can wish uh, and a happy end of year to everybody. Ah, yes. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye.